Uh, so let me do something which has something to do with learning, uh, namely applying some of these algorithms to L1 uh, logistic regression and support vector machine. Some of this is work in progress. It's joint work with John Ning, who's sitting in the back, and Wu Tao, who is, uh, was here early in the week. Uh, so here's the problem. Uh, given data X, which belongs to this space RM cross N, labels in RM and uh, they're either minus one or plus one. Uh, you want to minimize this function uh, and you regularize by L1. Okay, the idea is setting this hyperplane W transpose X plus V equals zero and then you can predict the outcome by getting the sign if you're on left or right. So this is uh, logistic regression. If you choose L to be of a certain shape, namely, uh, where is L? There it is. Uh, it is the sum of this, this, this crazy log term, the average of these log terms. Okay. So the observed training set is generated by a model which depends on the classifier output and you have conditional probability which I will gloss over and basically what you're doing when all is said and done is convex optimization which is minimizing this functional of W and V and V is one parameter, W is a vector uh, and you add L1 regularization. Okay. So we're going to do it differently slightly differently, and the difference will be the difference between ISTA and linearized Bregman, to be honest, precisely. In other words, instead of fixing lambda, which means you've chosen a level of sparsity in some sense, uh, we're going to actually get a sequence of solutions, approximate solutions to this, which will give you a nice path. Uh, and You can pick your own private lambda very quickly in some sense. Okay, so uh, that's the optimization problem, is a convex optimization. Uh, it's differentiable, in fact, that log function is differentiable and convex. Uh, compressive sensing, which we just labored over, or, is uh, related to the penalty problem, minimize uh, AU minus F squared plus the L1 norm of U. Sparse logistic regression replaces that linear, that quadratic thing which becomes linear when you take the derivative by this crazy log term, uh, and you add lambda times the uh, uh, L1 penalty, which is supposed to sparsify things, okay? So what we're going to do that is new is get rid of lambda in some sense. Uh, so here's the statement. Uh, if you minimize, the V is just an annoyance, but okay, uh, you minimize over W and V uh, plus lambda times the uh, L1 norm of W, uh, the regularization parameter impacts the sparsity. And in many applications, you want to know the, whole, the, the result for a whole sequence of lambdas. So if you took that seriously, you'd solve this problem for a whole bunch of different lambdas to convergence. And it gets harder and harder as lambda gets bigger or smaller, smaller, I guess, when there's less regularization. It gets harder and harder when lambda gets smaller. So we're going to get rid of that nasty problem by doing uh, the stuff I talked about with uh, linearized Bregman. And uh, I want people to use it. Okay. And this is very new. This hasn't been published yet. So here's a little review of this Bregman stuff. Uh, you're minimizing uh, this convex function plus J of W. Uh, instead of minimizing that, you minimize a sequence, which is uh, minimize uh, the Bregman distance between W and previous iteration, WK. There's also, you update V, which is a nuisance, but anyway, we do that by gradient descent. Uh, and the Bregman divergence was defined as before. It is the distance, this non-negative distance, which is never zero if, you, if J looks like this, but could be zero if J looks like this. The distance between these two points is zero, for example. Bregman distance, and that's very useful for convergence. Okay. Uh, okay. Very good. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We, minim we do this sequence of minimizers. Uh, if you get rid of the constant terms in Bregman divergence, it's just uh, minimizing what you started out with 
uh, minus L lambda, same lambda, times the, uh, the subgradient of the previous iteration in a product W. And if you take the derivative of that thing, you get an optimality condition, the Euler-Lagrange equations, whatever you call it, uh, that the subgradient to k plus 1 and the subgradient to k minus this, uh, uh, the gradient of this function, which is differentiable. It's this crazy log thing. Okay. And you start out with zero initial data. Everything is zero. So in the bad old days, which was like a week ago, what people would do was take a sequence of lambdas and uh, solve the problem and try to get the best lambda. And as we said, as lambdas get smaller, they get, this is a slower and slower procedure. Uh, what we're going to do is do this in one fell swoop. And we're not going to do exactly this. We're going to do something different, which I think is better, and we'll try to make that, that claim. Uh, so you minimize this uh, problem, uh, and instead of using the standard uh, penalty method, we are going to take a sequence of minimizers uh, based on this PK. Okay, so that's the minimizer. Everything else was constant. The only thing that you update is this, the only thing you retain is this quantity PK, that derivative, which is a signum of something. Okay more or less. Uh, so you write this out, and instead of using this algorithm, which is not completely trivial to solve, because every step of the game you would have to solve this nonlinear optimization problem. It's bad enough to solve this with, a, a, with AW, with uh, you know, AV minus B squared, but with this crazy log it gets hard. So instead of solving this exactly, we do what we call linearized Bregman, and more or less what Uzawa called Uzawa 50 years ago, but it's a little different. Uh, we linearize this term, the fidelity term. Uh, it's an easy idea, so this is a little bit technical, but not so technical. Uh, the value of the, at, at L average is equal to what it was plus uh, Taylor's theorem. If you, if you uh, had a linear piece in W, and if you assemble all the stuff and, and put it all together, you get back uh, the following. You minimize the Bregman distance, as before, plus, w my, uh, plus a quadratic term. It's like, so it's very much like what we did before, except the, the quadratic term involves a previous iteration of the gradient of something complicated. But if you do all this stuff and finish you're fooling around and take a derivative, you get something which looks like this. And just hang on, the, the, don't panic, it's getting simpler and simpler. And finally, we arrive at a three line code. That's it. Uh, you have this gradient descent followed by shrinkage, as you always do. And it's not ISTA because the V is updated, not the, the W. Okay, so that's the algorithm, that's the entire algorithm. We have to update. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Z is updated, not W, forgive me. V is, is a red herring, which you do gradient descent on, so it makes it a little harder to analyze the problem, but not much, I think. Anyway, that's the whole algorithm. And this gives you, without a proof, but we, something we fervently believe, uh, a path uh, in, uh, in K which leads you to the minimum of L, uh, minimizer of L, and sub, such that, uh, in fact, L equals zero, that crazy function L with minimum of zero, uh, such that the L1, you minimize the L1 norm of, of what you have such that the L function is zero. And you get there in this way uh, by following K, not by changing lambda. So this is much, much faster. It's one iteration to go to change lambda, basically. It's one update. You don't have to do convergence. And so the proof is in the results, and the results are pretty good. We do as well or better uh, than the other method. OK, so let me show you. So that's the entire algorithm. Uh, it'll be on the web one of these days. OK, so the, the residual goes down real fast. Uh, 80 iterations, 10 to the minus third. Error. Okay. Uh, this is uh, 
noise-free case, no, no noise. And AZ is the area under the ROC curves, and we get the right answer pretty quickly after 100 iterations or something, a little bit less. And each iteration is very simple. It's a three-line code iteration. And with noise, we do well. Uh, you can see training versus testing. Okay. Uh, if you compare it to the grid search method where you vary lambda, it's like uh, eight or ten times slower. And because they have to literally converge for every value of lambda, and we just iterate. So I think this is an alternative way to vary. I don't like methods which vary lambda in the penalty method. It's not a good idea. Okay. Uh, and this seems to do the trick. But well, we don't have as much theory as we'd like, and the paper got rejected, which is a badge of honor in this field. Okay. But uh, anyway, we'll fix that. So why linearized Bregman? Well, it's fast. It generates a finely grained regularization pants. What, what does finely grained mean? Anyway, back there. It means uh, you, know, you can get there in one iteration, exactly, essentially. Uh, and we get similar results with like, uh, I don't know, one seventh of the time. Uh, in this particular example. As the problem gets bigger, we'll beat it by more, I promise you. Okay. Uh, we have discussion about multinomial logistic regression with no results, so maybe I'll skip that. I don't know if I want to do no results. But the idea, when you finish fooling around, the idea looks similar. Uh, you wind up solving for a vector w, a vector of vectors but we haven't done that yet. We don't have the right data yet. But the, you can see the algorithm when we do it will be simple. So this is just talking. But L1 regularized smooth support vector machine. This is exciting and new. It's like a week old and I think it works. Uh, SVM, uh, which looks like this. Uh, once again, you maxim this time you maximize the margin uh, and you usually have this max uh, one minus Z comma zero function. Uh, which is not differentiable in there. So it makes it a little bit of a nuisance to uh, uh, use second order methods or anything which involves derivatives. Uh, this is the standard primal support vector machine with the L2 term over there, U, W squared. Uh, well, that's not what we're going to do. But we do have methods to, uh, for that. Uh, you take the, look at the dual. I Maybe mean, I'll show you that later. And you wind up with something which looks like L1. You get the sum of the AIs. Uh, it's kind of interesting. With a couple of constraints. And we have what we thought was a fast method to solve this problem. But that doesn't seem to beat SMO, I must admit. So uh, we're not peddling that yet for a support vector machine. But the L1 thing seems to be working quite well. Let's go back to that. So we're going to induce sparsity in support vector machine. Uh, by looking at this problem where h is this max of 0, 1 minus z. And we want uh, uh, to actually get down to, z, to the minimum of that quantity. OK. And one of the problems is non-differentiability of the hinge. I'm not even sure that's such a big problem, but that's what people think. So what we did was uh, we smoothed it. So we take this function which looks like that. We put an epsilon down below over here. And we get something which looks like that. And when epsilon goes to 0, this thing still works, actually, amazingly enough. A very small epsilon now being attacked. Uh, and the results seem to be OK, even as epsilon goes to 0, I think. But uh, well, the, the nice thing about this is that you can differentiate with impunity, and you can get linearized Bregman. And linearized Bregman for this guy seems to be, one more time, very fast. So you don't need a lambda. You get a path. And you get something which we think is going to be uh, a good way of doing L1 support vector machine. This is very new. So uh, it, it would be fun to try. We got some preliminary results which look good. The logistic regression stuff works, for sure. That we've done a lot. Uh, this is new, and it looks good. Uh, so that. That's probably it for that. Any questions about this? But the advantage is a linearized Bregman is useful for a sparse learning because you get a full regularization path with very little computation. 
You don't have to do a whole sequence of lambdas, which is what Tib Sharani pushes in his uh, stuff. You compute the full regularization path with very little computational effort, and you get uh, early stopping. Uh, instead, of, instead of searching for parameter, you search for a stopping criterion. But uh, that's easier, I think. OK, so that's time to stop. Any questions about this? OK. So let me go on. OK. The question is, how do, you, how do you get desired sparsity? Somebody asked me that during the break. Or is there anything to do about that? So this is going to look familiar, but I promise you it's different from something that, that is, uh, has been around. Uh, there's something called LARS, uh, which is a method of getting a, a whole continuum, uh, a continuing uh, a homotopy, a homotopy method for varying lambda, essentially. Uh, we're going to do something different. Uh, and it's related to Bregman iteration. So it's an adaptive inverse scale space method for compressed sensing. And when you have a very sparse problem, this, is, this to, in my opinion, is the world champion fast way of solving it. Uh, this seems to beat everything. But it's only when the, 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 the L1 minimum is super sparse. And then you get there really, really fast. Okay. And it's related to Bregman iteration. So one more time, uh, Bregman iteration for solving minimum J of U such that AU equals F is very successful for L1 in total variation. And B11 means sum of coefficients, wavelet coefficients. It's rated, and all these, and one more time, it's related to augmented Lagrangian, Uzawa, and ADMM, but they're all, they haven't really been applied in this area. Uh, the, the, historically, this work I did with uh, Martin Berger, Donald Goldfarb, and Jinjin Jin and Wotal used Bregman iteration to improve TV restoration. Then we used it for compressive sensing, and then Goldstein uh, and I did it for, uh, we introduced ADMM to, for total variation. I'll talk about that soon. So one more time for the 15th time. Bregman iteration looks like doing this minimizer. Uh, if you look at the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation, you get pk plus 1 minus pk is this. But now something interesting happens. I, I'm a continuous type of guy. I'm not too discreet in my life and everything else. I like continuum type stuff. So if you take that lambda over there and divide by it, this begins to look like a derivative. It's pk plus 1 minus pk divided by lambda. That looks like you're advancing in time and taking dividing by the time step. It looks like a numerical approximation to dp dt plus a transpose a u minus f equals zero. This is not the u dt by God. This is dp dt. The u dt is different. That is gradient descent. That's not what we're doing. This is uh, dp dt. This is a derivative of the subgradient, totally different. So remember that, the derivative of the subgradient uh, plus a transpose a u equals f. And what you can do, this is called inverse scale space. You start out with u equals 0, p equals 0 equals 0, and you advance in time. Now you would think that only a lunatic would consider this for L1, because the subgradient, the derivative of the absolute value of something, uh, of, a, of a function is 1 uh, if it's positive and minus 1 if it's negative, and, it has a, and it's, it's ambiguous in between. So that kind of, it, it's, it's a very on-off type of thing. So how can you solve that equation? Well, you can't actually. Uh, and we looked at it for a long time, and now we have a jazzy way of doing it in the special case of L1. And this is going to re resemble Lars. And let me write this down, okay. Uh, if you minimize, say, for example, the L1 norm of, what am I calling it, U or something, uh, plus, let's say, T over 2 times AU, what am I calling this, minus F squared, okay. Uh, if you look at the, if you, this is just old-fashioned type stuff, you, you get P, which depends on T, subgradient of u plus t times a transpose a u minus f equals zero. I'm writing too small, I'm sorry. And you finally arrive at p over t is equal to minus a transpose a u minus f. And this, would you believe, is something called Lars, where you just continue in time and you get a, uh, or in lambda, you differentiate, uh, you, you advance in time and you update. Uh, 
this quantity. You solve this problem for a discrete, for a discrete set of t. It turns out that things don't change. T varies, and you discreetly change. Uh, and that's been around for a while. That's called Lars. We are doing something different. The PDT is equal to uh, minus A transpose AU minus F. OK. This will converge to, uh, uh, will never give you the constrained optimization problem, namely minimizing L1 norm of U such that AU equals F. We get there in a very few steps. It's, it's a slightly different method, which is super fast for solving very sparse problems. And I'll give you an algorithm which is very easy to implement. OK. Again, if, if the results are sparse. OK, so that's, that's what we're going to do. The PDT plus A transpose A U minus F equals 0. It seems like an interesting curiosity. However, it leads to, in my modest way, the best algorithm uh, for minimizing the L1 norm of U such that A U equals F if it's uh, sparse, if you're getting something sparse. It looks like orthogonal matching pursuit. Uh, if any of you know, did anybody know about that stuff? Yeah, well, that's different. That's L0. Uh, this is, this uh, gives you L1 minimizers. Uh, the idea is quite simple. It resembles something that we did before with linearized Bregman, but I haven't got time to go into that. OK. And this, again, is super special for L1, super duper special for L1. This doesn't apply to anything except L1. We're trying to make it apply to the total variation and so on, but haven't gotten there yet. So you have a vector, uh, u1 up to un. We have p, which is the derivative of the absolute value of u. If p is 1, then u is positive. If p is minus 1, u is negative. If p is less than 1, then u has to be 0. If p is less than 1, u has to be 0. OK, that requires a little thinking, but yes. P is the derivative of the absolute value of u, which is either plus 1 or minus 1, or something crazy in between plus 1 and mi if, if u is not equal to, uh, if u is 0. It could be anything between plus 1 and minus 1 then. So when, when you start out, you start out initially with p equals 0, and you're solving the equation dp, d, where am I? Oops. Yeah, dp, dt is that, that equation down there. Okay. So p initially is 0. That means u of t is equal to 0 for some time. It's equal to 0 until you hit the place where a transpose f equals 1 in magnitude. One of the, one of the vector quantities equals 1. Initially, they're all 0. Okay. That's the first time in which you receive that uh, value. Uh, so p is equal to t times a transpose f until you reach t1. After you hit t1, you stop, and you do a least squares optimization. You have, a, you have values for which p is 1, values for which p is minus 1, and values for which p is 0. And typically, only a couple of them will be not 0. Very few, especially in the sparse case. Then you compute u by doing a least squares minimization. You minimize a u minus f squared such that u is 0 in, I plus, in, I, in uh, where it's 0, positive where it's positive, uh, negative where it's negative. And this is a very small non-negative least squares problem which you can solve fast. You stop, and then you advance. Well, you, start, you start all over again with that value of u. And u stays constant until p, once again, some new component of p hits 1. And then you repeat this. So this gives you a discrete procedure for adding points um, and doing this kind of uh, Bregman iteration really fast. Uh, and this works, uh, it doesn't work if you got a million non, if you have a million uh, non-zero uh, components of the solution. But if only, only a few, this is the world champion speed, speed uh, freak for solving the constrained optimization problem. And it is slightly different from this Lars business, which doesn't give you constrained optimization. Never does. When we get there in a finite number of steps, so, so again, you go from T1 to T2, and, the, and T2 is the first T for which there exists a J for which P equals 1. And you solve for T2. You again do a non-negative least squares. And our thing is perverse enough that the sparsity could decrease, actually. Because you might hit something, a place where several of these guys uh, change sign. 
and you might lose some of the components in time uh, along the, uh, but these are all very, not, very low dimensional non-negative least squares and you inch up and finally in a finite number of steps get to the exact answer and each step is very simple it's a non-negative least squares but it's not so simple if you have a, a huge number of non-zero uh, non com components but it is simple if, there's only, if it's sparse uh, so I recommend this for, and it's not hard to program, uh, for super sparse reconstruction. Uh, this is different from orthogonal matching pursuit. They, they are the support monotonically increases, uh, and you can fool that one. We guarantee that you get the L1 minimum. This thing converges. It's a theorem. It gives you the L1 minimum. Uh, they are doing a non-convex optimization, so wild and crazy things can happen. Okay. Uh, our method has the property that a u of t monotonically approaches f and that the error is o of 1 over the square root of t. You converge to an L1 minimizing c solution and the Bregman distance is o of t to the minus a half. And we have crazy results. If a satisfies the, ah, by the way, when is L, uh, this we never discussed, when does L1 really imply L0? Well, uh, the theorem of Terry and uh, Emmanuel says the RIP property, which is something about the way the columns behave. And it turns out that, if, of course, it works way beyond that. And again, our stuff here always gives you the L1 minimum. But, if, but it turns out that if, it, if A satisfies RIP, of course, we'll get the L0 minimum, too. And it turns out that if the support of 2 is two-dimensional, we get there in two iterations. It's kind of a cute result for what it's worth. So uh, this is a very fast algorithm. And that's it for that. I can show you one or two slides about it. Oh, it's impossible to see, but uh, the upper left is the exact solution. This is one iteration, two iterations, three iterations. Uh, and we get there in like, I don't know how many, six or seven. Okay. Um, and you can see that we actually get some weird stuff in the middle, but we finally converge. Uh, so the sparsity actually decreases at one step. And some of the intermediate things we get are not part of the uh, final solution. And uh, this is just an example of OMP screwing up, which I'm not going to make a big deal about. OK. So now, uh, let's talk about something which is it's going to lead to a learning algorithm, but it's completely different. It's something in photography which I think is interesting in its own right. So bear with me. This is not exactly learning, uh, but it's fun. It's an application of the stuff I'm talking about. And it leads into a, uh, an interesting learning algorithm. So this is called Retinex theory. OK. And I, I've, apparently, lots of you guys have interest in image processing here, or imaging. Anyway, so this is an L1-based variational method for Retinex and its application to medical images with uh, students and uh, the student and uh, faculty here. OK, retinex theory. The color recorded by an image depends on the reflectance of the objects and the illumination. The human visual system perceives color under varying illumination conditions. We can do amazing things. For example, over there, I don't know if you can see, A and B, uh, these two guys, if you recorded their intensity, those two squares would be the same. Although you know that B is a white square and A is a black square. You can just tell. Because you can compensate for the illumination. But a machine cannot. Uh, so the question is, how do you get rid of the illumination and just get what's called the reflectance out of this stuff? And uh, it's going to have something to do with learning, I promise. OK. So uh, that's an interesting example. So if you look at that, that's, that's the intensity on the left. This was formulated by this very smart guy, Land, a long time ago. Uh, the retinex is re retina plus cortex. It supposedly explains how the human visual system perceives color. The, e we make an assumption that, color, that uh, the same computation is done in all three channels. But more importantly, intensity is proportional to reflectance and illumination. And we can get rid of the illumination. But a machine cannot. And that's important for, uh, I, don't know, I have a project in hyperspectral imaging, for example. Uh, so you've got to take care of shadows. And this will get rid of shadows, supposedly. 
things like that. So in each uh, channel at every pixel, you write intensity is reflectance times illumination. You take the log, and so little i is equal to r plus e. And your goal is given little i, find little r. Get rid of little e. Get rid of the illumination. And this is not by no means a solved problem. I'm going to give you an approximate solution. OK. So here we go. Here is, uh, on the left, is reflectance. There's the illumination, which gets darker on the right, and the intensity screws up. And the black and white thing on the right have exactly the same intensity, even though your eye knows the difference. So if you measure the intensity, you get those two squares look alike. Isn't that interesting? Okay. So we can take care of that, but the machine cannot. So we want to subtract off that linear function somehow, just given nothing but the left-hand side. We have the left, and we want to find the right. Okay. So there's an L1. The answer, of course, is L1. The reflectance changes sharply, and the illumination changes smoothly. You take the gradient of this thing. The gradient of the reflectance is sparse. So if you look at the gradient, it's nothing but a bunch of uh, delta functions. And the gradient of illumination is a smooth nonsense. That's at least an ideal case. The, reflect the illumination could have discontinuities here, lights from different angles. This is a little more ideal. Uh, so there's earlier work by Morell, which motivated all this. But what you do is shrink uh, the, uh, you have that function, which is the sum of those two quantities. You get rid of the oscillatory part by, by using the shrink operation that we talked about before. So you just apply that shrink to that complicated function, and in principle, you get rid of the uh, uh, smooth part, that linear function. And there's the shrink. This is a hard shrink, actually. OK. And what you want to do is find, after all is said and done, you, want to, you now have shrunk the, the intensity, which is all you have, the gradient. You would like to find a function, here we go, this is where learning is going to play a role, whose gradient, r, is the sh Sorry, the shrunk version of the gradient of the intensity this is the first differential equation you've seen so far. Is that right? All week? I don't know. Has anybody done PDE? What kind of people are there? Uh, you take the divergence of this equation, and you get Laplacian of R is equal to gradient, uh, sorry, divergence of this shrunk business. And that's equivalent to minimizing an L2 norm, which is what people do in fluid dynamics every day. And this is me talking. We're not going to do L2. So instead of minimizing the L2 norm, uh, we'll skip all that stuff. We're going to minimize the L1 norm. So we're going to find a function whose gradient is close to a function which is not a gradient, but which is given in L1. So we minimize the L1 norm of that difference. And we're looking for a sparse vector field. And that will be the reflectance that we are looking for. And it actually works, not too badly. And one of the reasons I'm introducing it is that you can see how split Bregman works when you do this. So uh, we're minimizing j of u such that h of u equals 0. h of u is, uh, uh, let me see now, what am I saying? That's, OK, that's Bregman iteration in that case, but this is different. Uh, what we're doing, uh, here's the cute idea. Sorry about that. OK. So we want to minimize the gradient of r minus that shrink operation. We call that whole quantity phi of u. So that, that j is gradient. Phi of u is, is uh, uh, d minus, is, is u minus that gradient. And we minimize the sum j of d, d plus h of u such that d equals phi of u. Maybe this is a little bit much to absorb. And the issue is the issue solved by Bregman iteration. You update these things alternatively, and that's split Bregman for this problem. It's a little bit much to absorb, in, in a, especially Friday afternoon at 4.30, but uh, it's simple. OK. So after all is said and done, this is the problem you're going to solve. Uh, minimize that square root of dx squared plus dy squared such that d minus grad r minus that crazy thing is equal to 0. And that you do by dear old Bregman. 
Uh, and then let me just show you how simple the algorithm. Okay, I'll skip a whole bunch of steps. Here we go. There's the entire algorithm. You initialize with r equals zero, d equals zero, and the only thing you need to do is solve. This is for this audience. It might be terrifying because you're not PDE. Is you solve Laplace equation, uh, and then you shrink. Okay, so there are two steps to these split Bregman methods. One is solving Laplace's equation when you apply it to total variation, which is a simple problem. It's the easiest PDE to solve, uh, and you only solve it approximately. And the second step is to apply shrinkage. And then you update the error, and that converges. And that is split Bregman for total variation. And that's super duper fast. Uh, so at least you get the idea that there's nothing scary about uh, minimizing things involving the integral of the absolute value of the gradient. The only thing you have to do is solve Laplace's equation, which means uh, uh, a PDE with, oh, never mind. Anyway, does everybody know what Laplace's equation is? Yeah. Anyway, OK, so you solve that, and you apply shrinkage, you update, and you get this, uh, get results like this. Uh, the lower right shows how you get rid of the contrast. I'm uh, sorry, lower, the lower, uh, uh, the bottom column. Uh, and the top columns were the other, older methods in the same direction. And similarly here, and you can change the threshold and get better results. And you can apply it to medical images where it really makes a difference. Uh, you do some denoising. And uh, you can't see very well. I always say it looks better on the computer, but it really does. Uh, you can get rid of the shadows. And down below, you can actually see uh, data that you cannot see very well above. So this stuff sort of works. Okay. What are we doing? Let me just remind you. We were minimizing uh, grad r minus something. Now, this is going to have something to do with learning. So here we go, finally. So I gave this talk in uh, Shanghai, and there was a smart guy there who had done something involving pairwise ranking. And this is somewhat relevant. Statistical rank aggregation from pairwise preferences. And now I'm talking a totally different language. No more vision physics and whatnot, but it's a similar problem. So you want to, from a pairwise preferences of, of users, you want to find the global ordering of the alternative. Uh, for example, top 10 lists, elections, uh, tournaments, and so on. Suppose you have, uh, you want to rank tennis players. Tennis players work where A plays B, B plays C, and C may play A or he may not. And there could be inconsistencies. A could beat B, it happens all the time. B beats C and C beats A. Um, what happened? And uh, so how do you make sense out of these inconsistent pairwise rankings? And not everybody plays everybody. You have incomplete information and you have contradictory information. And you want to make the best possible, in some sense, uh, a seeding for a tennis tournament, for example, uh, based on this kind of information. Uh, so your goal is to find a potential function such that phi i j minus phi i minus phi j induces an ordering on the alternatives. Phi i is greater than phi j means that i is a better player than j. That i should be a given a, it should be ranked c to higher in the tournament than j. Uh, and this this kind of stuff happens all the time actually. I mean there are uh, people doing these things in Las Vegas, for example. Uh, betting and machine learning, information retrieval, uh, I don't know, uh, design of experiments. There's lots and lots of applications of this stuff. Okay. And, there, and it's been around for a while. And our contribution is, is going to be interesting. It's not revolutionary, but you'll see our movie rankings are better than the L2 rankings, I think. Okay. So ranking problems have an old history. Uh, Small data sets, and typically just A is better than B, not the, that means ordinal, rather than cardinal, where you have numerical ways of evaluating how much better. And there was a big controversy in the French Academy. The French are crazy, and they were fighting about this. Uh, there was a, and, and there is a paradox, of course. You can be intransitive. A is better than J, J is better than K, and K is better than A. What do you do about that? And that happens all the time, different styles, boxers. I'm old enough to remember Foreman, Fraser, Ali. It was not linear. 
and uh, uh, there are also voter biases. Okay, so you got to do the best you can. And how do you do the best you can? Well, we'll, we'll throw something out here. Uh, so given uh, you find a potential function such that phi i is greater than phi j, uh, phi i minus phi j is, is w i j, you formulate an optimization problem such that gra on a graph, and now we're talking about graph stuff, not the grid. On a graph, the gradient of phi minus y is to be minimized. And that looks like this retinex stuff. So I gave this retinex talk, and this other guy, and this guy jumped up in the audience and told me about this problem, and that's how this happened. Okay, so a totally different application and a, and a kind of interesting one. Uh, and the idea is to make uh, phi, find the gradient which equals this difference. Not an, that's not an easy thing to do. A gradient is restrictive. Okay, and a small value of this objective function means you're close to a gradient. So what do you have? You have a set of all alternatives, you have a set of voters, you have ratings, uh, for example, jokes, which is really subjective. Uh, you have to, uh, uh, you define lambda ij, the set of lambda such that lambda looks at both jokes and decides which one he likes better. And supposedly, psychologically, evaluating things, it's easier to compare than it is to, 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 much, much easier to compare A and B rather than a whole, picking the best out of a whole bunch of uh, elements because people usually do these things sequentially. So missing data implies a zero weight. You can use uh, weighted norms because it depends on how many observations you have. You can also make your comments about the user. And uh, this has lots of advantages. And these guys, the guy who suggested the problem is Yao, the last, next to last author up there. And they did L2. Uh, and they got some results. L2 is strictly convex. If you minimize that, you get some uh, approximate Laplacian. Um, you get a pseudo inverse, which I don't want to go into. And, uh, but you're not going to get sparsity. And we get some kind of crazy sparsity. Our sparsity is interesting sparsity. Sparsity here means that the gradient uh, that you actually find a function phi which is really equal, uh, whose gradient really equals the value you have uh, very often. That's sparsity. So you really get a gradient. Uh, and this is related to the Hodge theory, which I won't talk about. Okay. One of the problems with the way they did it was solving Laplace's equation on a graph is expensive. And solving what we're going to solve on a graph is actually faster, even though it's more nonlinear. It uses uh, graph cuts. So the L1 version is this. Minimize this uh, functional, the, the L1 norm with this weights, W, which I won't go into, but you can imagine how the weights get involved. Uh, and you can solve it. It's a linear program. Uh, and you have... Uh, so I have to normalize. The sum of phi has to be zero because it's not unique. You can add a constant to phi. Uh, and you have non-negativity constraints. And the solution is not going to be unique. It's an n minus one dimensional uh, polytope. And there's the algorithm, which I won't talk about. It's a uh, graph cut. It was done by Jerome Darbon, who was sensational at this stuff. So it's, it's, it's relatively fast. Uh, you can interpret the residual in the sense of compressive sensing. It's uh, uh, argmin of that quantity. The optimal residual minimizes the L1 norm. The residual minimizes the L1 norm such that uh, orthogonal projection of, of R is equal to orthogonal projection, I'm sorry, grad R of grad Y. So uh, the residual is sparse, we think. Okay, that's interesting. And here is the complete triumph for our stuff. This is supposed to be funny. That uh, if you order the movies by different ranking methods, uh, which we did, we had a Yahoo data set. Uh, there was a million movie pairs. And we had 83% of uh, the data. It was, com it was complete. And L2 put friends as number three. Now, that's obviously ridiculous. 
Yeah. Uh, whereas we don't have friends, so I feel good about that. I don't like, I don't, I like a rear window, for example. Uh, so L1 beats L2, at least in my eyes. Anyway, this, this is the ranking uh, for these movies. Okay, and the, uh, the average user ranking is just a trivial way of doing it. I don't think there's anything definitive here. But uh, I like the fact that we don't have friends. Okay. Uh, and if you look at it, you will see that uh, the number of small values in the residual we get in L1 is much, is much larger than for L2. So that is kind of encouraging. So anyway, this is uh, using these techniques to do learning. I guess it is learning. I don't know what you characterize it as. Uh, but anyway, uh, and I will now do something a little more advanced than this. So we push this a little bit further. And this is a lot harder to explain, so I'm going to do a little, I'll only do part of it. Uh, this is optimal data collection. So the, we just figured out how to rank people who've already played the game. The next question is, how do you set up a tournament that is fair? That uh, you have to maximize something. I mean, it would be unfair for the two best teams to play each other quite a way because if it was single elimination, because a good team would get eliminated, right? So you'd have to do something which somehow compensates for that kind of problem. Uh, I mean, if you just kept doing that stuff, then the, the, the best of the worst teams would play the best of the best teams, and that's not fair. So given the previous history, how do you set up a, uh, a schedule? How do you set up a schedule? And this is cool. Nobody, the, the stuff we talked about before, many people have done. This is new, man. This really is. Okay. And we didn't do L1. We did L2 because L1 was too complicated. So there's more work to be done. This is joint work with three very smart young people, all of whom are UCLA. You can see their names. So given weights and, and pairwise preferences, find the ranking. Well, we did that. OK. And this is a review of what I talked about before. There's the L2 version. There's the L1 version. OK. Now we're going to do something different. Optimal data collection. Uh, optimal, uh, optimize experimental design methods. Uh, so you want to minimize some function of the variance of phi sub w. Phi sub w is the function whose gradient is equal to y, to, to y. And w is the information collected. W is the number of times A played B and who won, that kind of stuff. And what, we, what we're doing right now here is optimizing over w. You know, how can you get a schedule that is fair? How can you get a schedule that is fair? Uh, given phi for a uh, phi for a, for a given w. And the function we're going to use is the maximum eigenvalue of this variance. And this is not trivial stuff, actually. OK. Uh, and what my colleagues proved uh, is if the error is a zero mean random vector with this given variance, uh, then you can get what you want by maximizing the second eigenvalue of the Laplacian with respect to W. This is not trivial stuff. Uh, so what you're doing is varying the coefficients in this crazy differential equation. And uh, uh, you have constraints. Yeah. Uh, the sum of W is given. And the more connections the graph has, the better it is. So if you have a situation where there's groups of people playing each other with, very, with no connection to two groups or one or two connections, obviously it's unfair. It's like all the teams in the East playing each other, all the teams in the West. And that's the way the NCAA works, basketball. So NCAA ratings are terrible. They are worse than random, as a matter of fact, much worse uh, in seeding the NCAA players. So uh, they should listen to us. We have a better way of doing it. Uh, but I mean, another way of doing it is just throwing dice. And, and it's much better than what they did. Uh, so here's optimal scheduling in the NCAA. Erdős Renyi means random graph. And the informativeness, the second eigenvalue that we're talking about down below uh, is 0.7 for whatever that means for NCAA. For uh, random, it's 20.2.8. So it's four times better. And what we do is like nine times better. 
And you can imagine, I mean, the way NCAA works is that regional teams play each other. And that is totally unfair uh, to do a seeding that way. So this, there's a lot more work that can be done here. And it's based on this kind of optimization. And let's see, is that the last one? And that's references. And this is probably a good time to quit. So thanks. Yeah.